Hello, this is Nick Pino, the EMF guy. I'm the author of the non tinfoil Guide to EMFs and the host of this Smarter Tech podcast. Today, I have the immense privilege of talking with uh, someone who is becoming a close colleague, Dr. George Roth. Uh, Dr. Roth, thanks so much for being here today. My, my total pleasure. And it's a lot of fun connecting with you. For yeah. sure. I love the way you are looking at life and looking at helping people and uh, your energy is just infectious. Oh, thank you. Well, likewise, we spent time together. We had the chance to, uh, you had the chance to uh, treat me. We're going to talk about your approach, of course, but uh, we became closer and closer in the last months, uh, exchanging on bioelectricity and the dev different solutions you develop. But before we dive into the discussion, let, just introduce yourself to the audience. I know you have uh, a vast background in different modalities, osteopathy, chiropractic, and uh, let's just make sure that people are aware of uh, where you came to this point as a professional? Sure. Yeah, I've been um, a practitioner uh, for almost, uh, well, this is, this will be my 46th year in practice. So I started when I was 11. So I'm, I'm younger than no, I'm just kidding. Anyhow, so <laughs> I, uh, I've, I've been trained as a chiropractor, a naturopathic physician, and spent many years uh, training in osteopathy as well. I've taught at uh, various institutions, um, chiropractic schools, osteopathic schools, the naturopathic college here in Toronto. And uh, yeah, over the years, I've been really uh, kind of a, a rebel, I guess, because uh, I, never, I never took for granted that the things we were taught were valid. I was always questioning them. So I became rather notorious as a student for doing that. And, but I think at the end of the day, what I, I discovered were things that people had been missing about how the body works and how it ties into the topic we're going to be talking about today, which is the bioelectricity of life on this planet and why it's so crucial that the discussions you're having about bioelectric and electromagnetic a pollution is such an important topic and it's it's much more serious than people have believed and i believe uh, that's uh, something that i've come up with a few solutions for and me and my colleagues have been looking into this for a number of years and had the privilege of working with a number of amazing uh, researchers and clinicians we will talk about a little bit later and developing these approaches um, so i hope to be able to share that with your audience today Tremendous. Well, I'll let you go. I know you have slides. I don't know if you want to start with slides sure. and uh, yeah. address kind of, I don't know, the basics of bioelectricity. I know a lot of people don't realize how bioelectricity works and it's not just brain waves, you know, or the heart rhythm. It's in fact, everything in your body has some type of electro electrical signal. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'll start with sharing a few slides here. Mm -hmm. And the topic, as I mentioned earlier, is bioelectricity and health and disease. And this is something I came upon sort of by accident over the years and recognized the importance of it. But many, many years ago, when I was still a student in chiropractic college, I was also teaching human anatomy and dissection. And we were looking at x-rays at the same time. And I started noticing that there was something odd going on with bone. And I noticed that there were differences in the size of bones on one side of the body compared to another. And for a long time, I didn't know what to make of this and what it represented. And no one uh, of my colleagues or my instructors or professors at the school had any idea how this would affect us or why it was important. <clears throat> so when I started noticing those changes, I, I started implementing some practices that seemed to affect that. And then it was many years later in 2005 that the actual science was developed to be able to look deep inside bone that verified that it actually got bigger due to injury. And this was research done at the University of California by Dr. Paul Hansema and Dr. Fentner and his group. And so this is something that we now know that when bone is injured, and this happens all the time, it gets bigger and it stays bigger. And really that changes everything because the bony framework of the body determines how many, many systems work, how our 
our function and our biomechanical function, but even areas like the brain and the spinal cord and our internal organs are affected. So the framework of the body, which is a dense framework uh, formed by the skeleton, is something that's incredibly vulnerable to injury. And so I say life on planet Earth, and I show people these differences. And if you uh, in the audience even start looking at these things, you know, compare the size of your knees, for example, on one side or the other, or look at your family member or child, you'll see this actually these differences in them and in yourself. And this will show up in the hips and the knees, in your ankles, in the, in the shoulders, in the, and even in the head. All of these areas are vulnerable because we are subject to the forces of physics, which is gravity, momentum, and motion. And when we encounter an immovable object, something has to change. And our body does absorb that. And bone, because of its density, tends to absorb that and changes. And that's, as I said, been verified. So what this does now, it changes things. So there's something called strain patterns. So when we talk about an injury to something like bone, for example, I call that, we call that a primary restriction. It's a source of injury that creates tension, okay? That source of tension is represented here. Look, if we look at the bone and the femur here, this little asterisk represents let's say a fall on the hip, which causes the bone to expand. Now, because of the way the body's interconnected at the cellular level here, you can see this basic framework here. The cells are actually formed of a fibrous framework inside and outside and between cells so that everything in the body is interconnected, which means that an injury in one part of the body will cause mechanical stress causing symptoms in many other areas like neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, knee, foot, ankle. All of these areas can be reacting to one source of injury, but of course, throughout life, we have many sources of injury. So as you're sitting there listening to this, I'll get you to try a simple exercise to demonstrate this, all right? So just sit with your eyes closed for a moment and put your hands on your lap, Okay, and I'd like you to just close your eyes and just be aware of the tension in your neck and shoulders. All right, and then as you're sitting there, I'd like you to go ahead and clench both fists, okay, and notice the sensation of tension in your neck and shoulders. Okay, and then relax your fists. Okay, try that a couple of times and notice how it instantly changes the tension in your neck and shoulders, and most of you will feel that. All right. This illustrates, uh, simulates an injury in one part of the body, the fist tension, the fist clench is a source of tension now, but it's instantly transmitted throughout the body. And this is what happens when we have these primary restrictions. So this causes mechanical stress. The body has to compensate for it. It creates irritation and pain in many cases. And that strain is transmitted via something we call the biotensegrity matrix. And that's the cellular and, inter, and intercellular fibrous framework that connects everything in the body, which is very useful when you need it. For example, this is what allows a mother in distress, uh, this case is where they've lifted a car off of their child. There's no way the muscles in the arm could do that by itself. The entire framework and the entire muscular system has to coordinate to create these forces. Weightlifters know this. Martial artists know this. <clears throat> this is something that is inherent in the way the body is put together so that it works as an integrated whole. The problem occurs when there is an injury and this system is disrupted. That leads to pain, mechanical pain, cellular dysfunction. The cells actually start to function abnormally. This has been verified by various studies. Um, and then that can cause disease, literally changing the way cells function at a, at a physiological level, leading to many conditions. And so this is well known in the cell biology world. And I've worked with a number of cell biologists who can verify that. Uh, some of you may have heard people like Dr. James Oshman, uh, Dr. Donald Ingber, both of whom I've worked with. These are people who understand this integrated nature of tissue. Now, 
The challenge with all of this is, uh, I will just dive, dive, uh, just back up for a moment here, is by accident about probably about 35 years ago when I started to develop this process, I discovered that when these, cell, these primary restrictions develop, it actually causes a disruption in the bioelectric nature of tissue. And I discovered this by accident by literally just testing an area. And even before I touched the area to mechanically test it, the area, another part of the body relaxed. And I realized that the approach of my hand might have been applying a normalizing electrical field or a bioelectric field, and that affected the tissue. So this actually evolved into our ability to detect these bioelectric changes, which is a huge benefit to our diagnostic procedure. Okay, so we actually go into this with our process in looking for what we call something called a bioelectric assessment. And that bioelectric assessment is something that's been facilitated by the development of technology that we've been working on for a number of years. And we now have a device that we are using, which is called an alternating polarity concentric magnet, which generates a normalizing bioelectric field on the body to provide a, a, a field that will temporarily turn back on the bioelectric current in an area that's been injured. And that provides a big clue as to where the problem is coming from, because where you have pain and where the problem is, is often very different. Mm -hmm. And so this unique structure here, which has a long history and we've been developing it further, we've been able to apply to this uh, approach. And this is, creates a, what's called a cascading bioelectric effect, which actually induces microcurrent. And microcurrent, we now know, is the way one of the ways the cells communicate. And if, without that microcurrent communication system, cells start to break down, they behave abnormally, right? And so this cascading effect of this, this alternating magnet provides a normalizing effect, which helps us detect the injury, okay? But also allows us, as you'll see in a moment, to treat it. So this has been verified with four independent uh, double-blind studies uh, to show that it actually induces pain modulation, reduces pain, tissue repair, but we know that it does more than that. And we've had some development in understanding uh, the nature of these devices, and that's something that has very, been very helpful to us in our assessment and treatment. So the bioelectric assessment is something we can use because of the interconnected nature of the body, we can apply a normalizing field. And this device I have in my hand here with the white disc has that alternating polarity concentric magnet, which we can apply to different parts of the body. And then that's creating this effect of uh, uh, applying the normalizing effect to the tissue. And then the other hand is actually testing the tissue tone, which tells us when we are actually turning off an injury, which is we use what's called the indicators. This is what a, a practitioner who, do, who works with the techniques I've, we've developed uh, uses to assess the body, all right? <clears throat> so the treatment actually applies this technique along with a gentle form of pressure designed to bring back into alignment, this distortion in the bone structure, which amazingly enough comes back to relative normal. Even after many years of injury, we see these changes taking place. And we'll show you some x-rays a little bit later that verify that. So we've been able to demonstrate those changes using x-ray, for example. So this combination of containment, which is gentle pressure, along with a normalizing microcurrent field, which we call entrainment. So we're basically inducing a normalizing field along with a normalizing pressure can allow the molecular structure within the bone to restore that microcurrent and therefore restore a normal, healthy structure to those tissues that have been injured. <clears throat> so, you know, when we tell people about repatterning and, you know, the idea of, I came up with this name matrix repatterning, because it's restoring the normal pattern. So we now know that injury changes the cell structure, 
Yeah, the puzzle pieces literally don't fit anymore. Like there's there's two bones, for example, in the knee, for example, in the shoulder or the hip that no longer fit. And so this causes wear and tear and strain and pain. Okay. And it also, we now know, disrupts intracellular communication, which affects how cells function. And the problems keep returning. So many techniques used to treat musculoskeletal conditions and other injuries or, or diseases, problems often return when these areas are not being properly identified and addressed. <clears throat> so with matrix repatterning, which is the technique that we developed uh, to address these, is applied, we can restore ideal size and shape very quickly to these structures, which allows for restoration of optimal, optimal biomechanics, which allows joints and muscles to work much more efficiently. And that also restores intracellular communication. We can know that also from lab tests done on some of the areas that we treat, which can include internal organs like the liver, kidney, so we see improvement in blood pressure, liver function, liver enzymes, cardiac function, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit more about brain function because that's a huge area that we've investigated as well. And so then the puzzle pieces essentially fit. And the body knows how to heal itself when that's restored, which is a beautiful thing to behold. So a number of years ago, uh, yeah, I'll just show you a couple of x-ray examples here. Um, so the x-ray examples here are showing an example of a young lady. This is one of my students who treated her. Uh, she had a fracture to her tibia. Uh, when he saw her, it had already been there for five years. It would not heal. They had to put a metal rod in, as you can see here. This is a metal rod. You can see the bo damaged bone here, which is not healing after five years by the time she, he saw her. This is another view from, this, from the side. Okay, showing the same structure here. And uh, basically, she couldn't walk without assistive devices. She had to use a walker at the ripe old age of 15. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a devastating injury. So now, this is what happens after treatment. Okay, normal healthy bone is restored. Mm. This is verified on x-ray. And this is what happened. And this took all of six treatments. All okay? right. And this is something that practitioners from around the world who are trained in this are able to provide. Uh, the uh, rod has actually been removed now, and she is functioning like a normal, healthy teenager. I think she's about 17 years old now, and she's doing really, really well. Uh, so this is the kind of change that can take place even after many years of bone injury. And when we talk about bone size differences, this is another example here of a young hockey player, a teenager, who was suffering from severe knee pain, which is preventing him from playing hockey. His parents noted that he was hobbling up the stairs uh, in pain all the time. This is his left knee. And the uh, surgeons who were monitoring him, the specialists, orthopedic surgeons, were monitoring him because of a genetic condition very closely. So to actually measure bone size on an x-ray is a very tricky thing to keep it consistent. But they were able to do this because of this in unique situation. And so what happened after treatment, and this was about three treatments after this uh, area showed up, they were able to measure a significant improvement in the size of the bone, which is a full five millimeters smaller after treatment. The, the actual joint you can see opens up here. Here it's wedged and there's an angle angulation to the bones. Now they're straighter and aligned and his parents were excited because he was flying up the stairs again and he was able to play hockey again. And so wow. this is the kind of thing that we see time and again. Thankfully, this time we had an opportunity to have it verified by people who, radiologists and surgeons who were closely monitoring his condition. So something, sorry to interrupt, but something that was very fascinating to me when we first met each other, you told me, uh, and that's something you mentioned, but please, please tell us again, why, why is the bone bigger when it's injured is it like yeah. i don't know i hit my liver and it can get swollen i know certain body parts can get swollen but sure. a bone swollen that, yeah, that yeah, was exactly. one of the first times i ever heard about that for sure yeah it was a mystery for a long time um i just noticed it many many years ago and then uh a, a cell biologist at harvard dr donald ingber who contributed to my book on matrix repatterning 
he was the one who basically clarified what happens to uh, cells when they're injured at the cellular level. Okay, they actually expand and become rigid. But it wasn't until the group at University of California measured this in bone because bone cannot dissipate the injury easily. It's very dense because it's mm -hmm. a crystalline structure surrounding the cells. And so it can't disperse that energy. And so it absorbs the energy, but that's an actual molecular change of state. It's a quantum change, we think. Okay. And that's a basically, a, and we'll talk more about that. That affects the bioelectric state of the bone, because now instead of generating current or conducting electricity, it becomes a resistor. It becomes a capacitor. And okay. that stored charge may be one of the reasons that it can't come back to its original size. And the only thing the body can do is compensate for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And okay. over time, you know, what do we see as people get older? They get more and more stiff. They have less and less mobility. They have joints that break down. And they have instability and all these things that develop over time. And this is the result of cumulative trauma that we see over many, many years. But what we've been able to do with this technique is reverse that trend, reverse the process by restoring the normal size and shape, which is amazingly easy and gentle, but only because we've identified the problem. And so if yeah. you identify the problem, you know where it's coming from, which is what we can do with our assessment, we can restore that. OK, <clears throat> and that's really the key to why this has helped so many people with different conditions. <clears throat> and so over the years, we've seen uh, improvements in many, many areas for, you know, obviously you know, uh, structural conditions, orthopedic conditions affecting pain in different areas of the body, but also some surprising areas with concussion and headaches and TMJ and dental areas. I've trained dentists in this ortho and or orthodontists, uh, dental assistants who've been able to help people with that area. Uh, but also we see, as I mentioned earlier, organ function improving, which was kind of surprising. Actually, I'll tell you briefly what happened about uh, 20 years ago. I was treating an animal, a dog. I treat animals as well. And I was treating a dog for a hip problem. And part of the hip problem I felt was coming from the rib cage uh, which was seemed to be an injury. And as I treated that, I, and his hip started to improve, great, that was fine. I got a call from the owner uh, a, a week or so afterwards that her his veterinarian, her veterinarian actually called in a bit of a panic because uh, wondering what had happened. And uh, she said that the veterinarian said, well, this dog had had elevated liver enzymes, which displays liver inflammation for five years. And they had been monitoring this liver problem and all of a sudden the liver was perfectly normal. So mm -hmm. this is, but now we've seen this so many times uh, happening uh, when we treat these injuries, organ function, digestion, liver function, cardiac function, many things improve. Things like esophageal reflux is a very common structural issue. And another, another one that's surprising, uh, urinary tract issues, bladder uh, issues, incontinence, erectile issues, snoring and sleep apnea is a huge area as well, which we deal with, which is often mechanical and all kinds of chronic pain. And so, you know, we basically, you know, share this, we train practitioners. Um, I've written a book for the general public, which is now un unfortunately out of print where I'm hoping to get another one out this fall, which will be available, uh, uh, to, you know, to our audience, but that's something we want to provide people with first aid techniques, things they can do on their own. And if they can't address them, then they can approach a practitioner trained in this technique. Right. So that's basically what this approach has done. It's helped prevent surgeries because of that. We've seen people who were scheduled for knee surgery, hip surgery. We've been able to prevent that. And a big area, as I mentioned, is concussion. And concussion is actually similar bone changes to the head due to direct or indirect trauma coming directly to the head, to the jaw, coming up through the neck into the base of the skull. It changes the environment in the head and therefore the brain. And we see significant uh, problems developing, of course, with this area. And when the nervous system is affected like this, we think this is one of the reasons that people often become much more electromagnetically sensitive, because this is an electromagnetic generator. This is a huge electromagnetic system that our body depends on to function. And when it's injured, nothing works properly.
And so we started applying this to concussions and we started noticing some significant improvement in neurological function, cognitive function, and so on. And so we can illustrate these changes in the shape of the head. A couple of examples here. This is an example of just a single treatment. Before treatment, we see there's like a depression in the head here on the left, and then it's a rounded shape um, afterwards. And then there's a young child here who has a distortion in the back of the head before treatment, and then it's a rounded, more rounded shape after treatment. And this is something that we've seen with many people with uh, head injuries. That you, literally, they can actually experience and see, or the parents in this case with the baby can see the change. And then very soon afterwards, there's improvement in neurological function. And that's been verified by a major researcher in this area, Dr. Norman Doidge, who is the author of the uh, best-selling book, The Brain That Changes Itself. He uh, started investigating matrix repatterning a number of years ago after reading my book and uh, spent quite a few years uh, interviewing patients, actually taking some training in the program, and recognized that this was a, a major intervention that he then talks about in his more recent book called The Brain's Way of Healing, um, which is another best-selling book. And his comments in the book, basically, he says, it view is it prudent to have a matrix assessment after any blow to the head, and mm. that he actually witnessed how quickly it can change. So he is Suggestion is a matrix repatterning should be in, applied in hospital emergency departments. And this is something he has witnessed, you know, with acute cases of head injury, how dramatically it can be brought back into a state of balance. And so this is something that uh, because of his uh, influence, we've seen people for head injuries from all over the world now. And many of our practitioners are able to help people with concussions. Uh, so this is the idea with matrix repatterning, and this is information uh, your viewers can check on uh, with looking at our website, matrixrepatterning.com. Now, here we have a problem. The problem happened about 10 years ago because we were doing very nicely helping people. Something happened about 10 or 12 years ago where I started to notice we were not picking up these subtle signatures of the electronic changes in the body. And something was interrupting it. Something was interfering with it. And I realized that there were significant influences coming from electromagnetic pollution, and we tried all kinds of methods to counteract that. It was very, very challenging. And so what I realized is we have to recognize that we live in an electronic environment in our in a world that basically is the background state of electrical information that is that is supports life on this planet at all levels and so this these frequencies which people may know in this group uh, as the schumann frequencies these are generated by uh, uh, lightning strikes which happen roughly at 50 to 100 times every second around the world and are creating waveforms throughout the ionosphere between the upper layers of the atmosphere and the earth's surface which are conducting electrical current and create waves around the planet that uh, work at specific frequencies, okay? There's some dominant frequencies, some secondary frequencies. However, this is uh, an issue that is uh, causing problems now because there is a change in the electromagnetic field of the Earth. The actual electrical generation of the core of the planet is going into a decline right now. So there's a weakening of these supportive electromagnetic fields due to what's called a reversal of the magnetic poles, something that happens every several hundred thousand years, which we have, you know, life on this planet has survived. You know, we have not experienced this as humans because the last time it happened was 780,000 years ago. So we're in for quite a ride. It's happening as we speak. However, at the same time, we've had a dramatic increase in abnormal electromagnetic frequencies introduced by electronic devices, which we now refer to, we recognize as electronic, electromagnetic pollution. And so this I recognize as a problem for our work because as these systems, and as these devices started to become much more 
ubiquitous. People were using smart devices and Wi-Fi routers, which more and more powerful signals, uh, smart meters, things like this that were being applied to homes. This was creating significant uh, interference with the electromagnetic properties of the body. And so what we have to realize is that the Schumann frequencies are how life evolved on the earth. These frequencies are generated by the earth in the ionosphere, within between the ionosphere and the earth's surface. And they are very specific, fairly low frequency waves, which circulate around the planet. They change to some extent between day and night uh, uh, frequencies, and they are almost identical to our brainwave patterns, okay? So these frequencies uh, between the theta and, and, the, and especially the theta, alpha, and beta are very similar, almost identical to the Schumann resonances. So this is an indication of how life evolved on this planet and why our physiology depends on this, these sources of electromagnetic stimulation, which supports life. And the problem now, of course, is that we have something quite different uh, and that's interfering with it. So because of this, I had to develop, I, I'll just back up for just a moment here. Sure. I had you know, serious issues trying to get this system to work in the last 10 years using different devices to counteract the effects. Eventually, I came up with a solution which is basically generating a more powerful Schumann frequency, mimicking this, all right? for our practitioners, okay? And this evolved into what we call the safe zone. This is something that we developed in order to help our practitioners, in order to, to create an environment that allowed them to pick up and treat these areas. And I'll tell you a little story about that happened probably, I think it's about three or four years ago. I it was the early development of this, this device. I, uh, one of my practitioners who was using it in her office lent it to a friend of hers. And her friend had a, has a son who has had epileptic seizures since the day he was born due to a brain injury. And he was experiencing 10 to 20 uh, epileptic seizures per, uh, per hour, okay? Wow. And so these were very serious epileptic seizures that were barely controlled by medication. And so these were interrupting his life, his mental development, of course, all of these things were affected. And so she lent uh, one of the earlier versions of this device to her friend. Within 24 hours, he basically stopped having seizures for the first time in 17 years. He has ha had almost no seizures now for almost two years. But there was one little incident uh, in early 2022, about two years ago, after the initial early version of the safe zone was introduced, um, something happened. Uh, she's living, she lives in the uh, Guelph area. Let me just think for a minute. No, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo. And at that time, uh, I think it was roughly January, 2022, they turned on the 5G generators because the University of Waterloo has a lot of high tech investment and wanted to implement 5G. Well, within, Within 24 hours, he was having seizures again. And by the way, the mother had severe tinnitus or tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ears, which she'd had for 20 years, which was resolved with the safe zone. All right. It all came back. So anyhow, so within a few weeks, because we've been developing the technology, we had a newer version of the safe zone, which we got to her. And it's a more powerful version of it. And so as soon as she got that, within 24 hours, all the symptoms resolved again, and they've been doing fine ever since. And so this was a clue that this was doing a lot more to help human bioelectricity, not just to use in our technique, but to help people perhaps overcome the effects of electromagnetic pollution that affects so many areas of life. So as a result of that, we basically developed this a commercial version of this product which is now available. So the safe zone uh, hyphen EM, the safe zone is basically provides the same range of frequencies as the earth produces. It mimics it, it broadcasts it into a large area in the home. It can affect uh, the entire uh, dwelling. And this will also set on a pattern where you can mimic the day night changes so you can set it to turn on at a certain time at night to mimic the nighttime frequencies 
compared to the daytime, which in, in this case stimulates sleep or stimulate more active cognitive function during the day. And so this can be set up as a program in the device as well. So this is very advanced technology based, and we thank Nikola Tesla for you know some of the innovations that we've applied some of this technology to the device itself. It's a very, very significant technological breakthrough. I've worked with a number of engineers and physicists from the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Magda Havis is part of the early development of this as well. And so uh, we've been basically developing research along with a number of scientists to basically validate the function of this. Dr. Deutsch has been involved in some of the uh, initial discussions in developing this as well. And then um, about a year, possibly uh, yeah, a little over a year ago, uh, we started developing a, a way of measuring the effects of this to validate it using a form of electroencephalography. And this device, uh, which Dr. Joy, Deutsch actually uh, suggested we try, is uh, developed in Canada by a group of scientists at uh, the University of British Columbia. And it's a way of measuring brain waves in response to certain stimuli to notice whether or not the person is functioning at a higher level of cognitive function or not. And so what we decided to do was implement this with the safe zone as part of a study, which we're now continuing to develop. And so as a result of that, we were able to uh, implement the, the NeuroCatch, which is this EEG platform, to measure the response of patients and subjects to the effect of the safe zone. And uh, uh, this device was developed in collaboration with Dr. Ryan Darcy, uh, a neuroscientist at the University of British Columbia, and Simon Fraser. And so what we did is we applied this to subjects with and without the influence of the safe zone, all right, in back-to-back -back testing. So what's interesting about that is in previous experiences with testing this device, the EEG device, back to back, let's say 10 to 15 minutes apart, is that the tendency for the subjects would be their cognitive function would decline because of fatigue, because you're stimulating the brain as well during this test. And so the typical results would show that there's a, a reduced perform performance because of fatigue, okay? However, when we tested this using the safe zone, there was a measurable improvement, which is quite surprising to the researchers as well. So this was something that was quite unexpected and we wanted to be able to hopefully demonstrate that and which we were able to. And so there's increased speed of processing with the safe zone after a test without the safe zone, okay? And also there was a reduced amplitude in some cases, which we believe is in many cases of brain injury, which Dr. Deutsch calls a noisy brain where too many areas of the brain fire in response to a stimulus and everything quieted down in those cases. Okay, that's a reduced amplitude, which means that the brain was calmer and quieter under the influence of the safe zone, all right? So the way that shows up in the graphical representation with the safe zone off, we were able to graph some of those responses. And the area you can see, for example, here in this illustration, whoops, something happened there. Let me go back. Okay, we'll try again. All right. So right here, you can see this blue area represents without the safe zone. It's a very aberrant. The normal range should be within this light green uh, shape here of all of the different stimuli. And then followed closely, we used the safe zone and we tested the same subject immediately afterwards. And you can see it falls within a normal range. Okay, which was, again, the surprising outcome. And we see that time and again with different test subjects, the blue, this abnormal reading, which was actually hard to capture initially and then showed up as a much more normal reading. So these are just some examples of uh, the blue being without the safe zone, the green reading showing with the safe zone. And then uh, we also did a couple of examples of, of one individual where we tested that individual with the safe zone off in both cases. And you can see that the reading is very similar. It's still rel relatively abnormal in both cases. And then the same subject 
tested a week later, I believe, with the without the safe zone, and then with the safe zone, you can see it's a much more normal profile as well. Okay, so a good example of the benefit of the safe zone, which we believe is something that's measurable. It's first time it's been used, this device has been used to measure the potential effects of electromagnetic pollution on the brain, and then adding a normalizing influence using the safe zone, okay? So this is why we believe, and we've seen many cases, people with chronic migraines, ringing in the ears, sleep disturbances. And I know, Nick, you had a very interesting uh, experience, which we'll talk about. We've seen that uh, happen a number of times. This is actually, uh, this particular recent, uh, uh, another example of, this is a separate case of epileptic uh, young girl that epileptic seizures and sleep problems. And uh, this is a, a medical doctor who's uh, one of my colleagues. She's actually taking the matrix repatterning course right now as well. Um, so this is something that so she found after the introduction of the safe zone that her daughter was sleeping better, the seizures never returned. In her case, she had an interesting response similar to what you experienced, Nick, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so uh, so she, she, her daughter is much calmer, able to sleep, and has not had any more seizures as well. So uh, this is a situation we've seen with animals responding, uh, dogs and cats who are agitated, scratching and pacing through the night, uh, in, instantly responding to it as well, which has been really gratifying because uh, this is something that uh, we we hope is a benefit to many, many people who have experience with this type of problem. So the benefit is uh, increased energy, increased cognitive function, we believe is supported during the day and deeper sleep uh, during the night, natural alarm clock function, which you can set specifically to turn on at a certain time in the morning, if you want to wake up at a certain time and when you want to go to bed. And so that's all, uh, you can program that individually. It has a very uh, large uh, expanded uh, broadcast area, which can uh, be um, transmitted throughout an area of the home. And you can control the intensity, which is also important because everyone's a little different response to different intensities. So, and that's another area that might be a factor. And then there are two different versions of the device for a smaller area, which is less expensive. We're up to 2,000 square feet. And then another device, which is the plus version up to 4,000 square feet. But I will say that sometimes the plus may be needed if there are higher levels of electromagnetic pollution in order to counteract it. So we've seen that happen in certain cases where that's necessary as well. <clears throat> okay, so this basically is something that it mimics the Schumann frequencies, which seems to be supportive, okay? It's been tested by independent evaluators, um, including the field testing. Um, and then we see improvements in many areas with headaches, tinnitus, anxiety, sleep disorders, skin irritation, seizure activity, uh, general well-being. Because I think, you know, this is just basically the way the brain is designed to work. And now what's important to recognize is the safe zone does not block or interfere with electromagnetic signals. Okay, so I just want to be clear, it does not block or interfere with these signals. So it's literally providing a supportive, compensating, normalizing field to support normal physiology of the, our entire body, especially the brain, we believe, which are biocompatible and in harmony with the natural frequencies of the earth. Okay. And that's really what this is all about. That's why we use the uh, byline, life is better in the zone. But, you know, the zone we should be looking for is something that reduces electromagnetic pollution, obviously, as much as we can. But in some cases, we can't. And so something like this might be a benefit as well. Yes. And of course, there's many instances where you reduce CMFs uh, as much as you can, but there's environmental exposures that are otherwise unavoidable. If you live in a city, that's a fact. If you live in the countryside, it depends. Are you getting lucky or unlucky? Uh, people sometimes are uh, take this, you know, home far away from a city and they're proud. Oh, you know, the closest tower is uh, miles away. 
until it's not and they install a cell tower nearby and they they have no say in where yeah. that uh, cell tower is placed so the reality is uh I think the reintroduction of something that mimics nature is just part of what I think is uh, the framework of how to survive this era. <laughs> if that's a, you know, it, it seems kind of doom and gloom, but the reality is this we have an increasing level of noise in the form of electropollution, and we have a decreasing level of natural signals. Uh, there's many aspects to this I could go on and on but just something that comes to mind is there's research showing that electromagnetic pollution might interfere with our vitamin D receptor and where I'm getting at is that the noise is even preventing our body from absorbing the natural frequencies from the sun or might be you know we don't even know to what extent but and anecdotally some practitioners t tell me I don't know what's wrong with my patients. They're in a city and they're getting tanned all over and over and over and their vitamin D stays low. There might be many factors, but it's plausible that the more you live in this high noise environment, the less you're able to read, in a sense, the Schumann resonance or uh, earthing or the sun and all these frequencies we need to normalize our bodies. So that's why when you told me about the idea of something that will try to mimic the Schumann resonance, I think I, I think it's something much safer than some other technologies that are, for example, using radio frequency radiation just to boost brain function or, or this and that. At least when we mimic nature, we're taking a framework that is much more likely to be biocompatible. But uh, tell me, that's not something I ever asked you about the safe zone. What kind of signal is it generating? Uh, as far as, do you know what kind of power density? Is it a power density that is uh, mimicking also the Schumann resonance? Or is it higher because we're trying to compensate because of all this environmental noise? Hey, let me interrupt this podcast for a second. I want to tell you about one of the EMF protection or health supporting tools that I really believe in and which in the end also helped me finance the costs of this show. Since writing my book back in 2017, it has become clear to me that a lot of people understand the dangers of EMLs very well, but struggle when it comes to getting started and actually implementing what they know they should be doing to reduce their exposure. And this is why I teamed up with Brian Hoyer, who's one of the top EMF mitigation specialists in North America, and we created a simple step-by-step -step EMF protection course that will show you exactly how to minimize EMFs in your home, step-by-step. It's called Electro Pollution Fix. We've had hundreds of health conscious people just like you take the course and the feedback has been mind blowing. This course is the best way to stop feeling overwhelmed or confused about EMF protection and be able to take action, reduce your risks and make your family safer. So check out Electro Pollution Fix. Just go to electropollutionfix.com and you can enter the coupon code SMARTER at checkout to save an entire $100 off of your course membership. So enjoy the discount and back to the podcast. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a, that's a question uh, in terms of the actual specifications of that. I would yeah. probably defer to the engineers who helped develop it. I really just had this concept that in order for us to compensate for the disruption caused by electromagnetic pollution, to me, nature always has the answer. So I came up with the idea, let's find something to mimic that. So as far as that, I think I have data on that. I don't have it on my fingertips, okay. but we know that it's me it's measurable at a distance enough that it does affect animals, humans in the environment up to a certain distance. Okay. And uh, the specifications of that, I, I don't have at the moment, but I will say that this is very similar. I would say to the idea you know, people talk about grounding and things like that. Yes. There are ways that we can engage with the natural background frequencies to help us basically compensate for these uh, disruptions that we're experiencing. And I think the safe zone provides one possible answer, but you know we need to do everything, like you said, and the physiology of the body and going back to matrix repatterning, because when you have an injury that's affecting bone structure, cell structure, organ 
structure. And then on top of that, but that's going to interrupt the bioelectric signals in the body, add to that another layer of interference on top of that. This is why I believe many people are even more sensitive than others. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that by restoring some of that cellular balance, we can help reduce electromagnetic sensitivity, but we have to look at it in a multifactorial way. I also think that physiologically, these fields are affecting our microbes, our mitochondria, our ability to respond to light, stimuli, infrared, near infrared, all of these things. To me, nature always has the answer. And so that's why, from my point of view, I tried to find something that would mimic the normal frequencies that are generated by the earth to at least compensate for some of the problems we're now experiencing. You know, so, and I want to just uh, talk to a little bit about your experience, which is I've seen sure. a number of people um, and maybe you can talk about your, your, cause you've used the safe zone for a little while now. Talk about your initial response to how you felt with the safe zone. Yeah. I, I yeah. can say the moment I, I, I plugged it in, I'm, uh, I'm don't consider myself extremely sensitive or reactive to EMFs anymore the way I used to be. The way I used to be is I'm in front of a laptop, there's Wi-Fi, instant brain fog. And I just start getting almost angry, you know, and angry at myself. I cannot get work. I feel confused and very, very frustrating. That was back in 2016, a couple of years ago. Now I, I feel like my brain is more stable where it doesn't get disrupted by these external signals as much. However, when I plugged it in, I felt a relaxation response, but that same night and then a few following nights, I had somewhat of a dis disturbed sleep for a few nights, which is something I've heard even from people who turn off Wi-Fi. In fact, there's one practitioner that told me, Nick, the first time I turned off Wi-Fi, I had insomnia for about almost two weeks. And that was surprising because we're not even talking about someone who considered himself electrosensitive per se, but his theory was my brain used to be entrained by the Wi-Fi and not by necessarily the primary frequency, which is 2.4 gigahertz, so 2.4 billion hertz or 5.8, but, but by the uh, the pulsating that is at 10 hertz, which is close enough to brainwave frequencies where it can cause your brainwaves to shift. So his theory was I used to be, you know, my body was functioning on Wi-Fi in a sense or being entrained by Wi-Fi. And when I stopped it, all of a sudden the sleep, you know, uh, patterns were all disrupted. So I, I've heard countless people tell me that. So is that what you think happened for me for a few nights before my brain was able to yeah, re-entrain yeah, itself? Yeah. And I've encountered that if, uh, enough enough times now uh, to speculate at least that, you know, you still had some sensitivity and yes. your brain had, you say, is entrained. And Dr. Deutsch would use the term neuroplastically adapted okay. to the higher frequencies. And so it basically trying to keep up with pace with those higher frequencies, the neurological function, and it creates agitation. And I think the increase in things like ADD, ADHD, autism, we think is linked partly at least to these types of frequencies. And we see a higher incidence of that. And so in your case, uh, similar to the person you mentioned who turned off the Wi-Fi, all of a sudden you didn't have that high frequency simulation to a greater degree. All of a sudden you know, the brakes were put on, you know, and your brain had to adjust to it. And I think it took you three or four nights to kind of get Something like that. used to it. And then you were able to, I, I suggested you turn the safe zone down to a low setting for a little while and then gradually increase it again. And then you've noticed, I think some, you know, some, adaptation and some improvement and i think your sleep seemed to be a little bit better with that as well so uh, yes yeah. this, this is something that also this uh this doctor who reported her daughter she had the same experience we've had a number of other people same re recommendation turn it down for i think it took her two or three nights uh to do that and now she when she comes home she just loves the feeling of being in the safe zone because then she notices the difference which because she's living in a big city you know we're constantly being bombarded and people who come into my home or into my office where the safe zone is running often notice how they just feel so relaxed right but i think there are people who will initially feel some disruption 
because of just the way the brain has become entrained, as you said. And so for those people, we suggest, and we do rec we do mention that in the instructions uh, to basically turn it back down to low for a couple of nights, you know, and then see how you respond and then gradually increase the signal again. So to me, that's verification that it is providing a normalizing field and ultimately does that because we know that with time over a period of anywhere from two to seven days, the brain will adapt and actually do much better uh, with those frequencies. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, someone wrote to me and asked me about the safe zone we were exchanging and they said, okay, well, do they have long-term safety studies? And then I, I think that's a bit of a romantic idea to, to think <laughs> that we, we can have long-term studies, you know, that are worth around five, $10 million for, yeah. for consumer products. But at yeah. the same time, there's a real, um, and, and I, I think there's a real concern over the fact that this is man-made EMF that we're using, but the same can be said yeah. for red light therapy, pulse electromagnetic field therapy, microcurrent therapy. So I'm 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 certainly not discouraging people from using man-made electromagnetic radiation when it comes to therapeutics because some of these modalities, including uh, photobiomodulation or red light therapy, including sauna, they've been proven or are heavily supported by science to have a safety profile. And then I guess you you got to experience the benefits and see so, what you, you think the risks might be. Uh, how do you respond to yeah. that? The okay. fact that well, obviously yeah. this is artificial, but it tries to mimic nature. Oh, for sure. And, and it's, it's, always, it's always a good question. And it's come up before. Uh, first of all, it's approved by FCC. And so they measure the fields and they recognize, and it's a low volt system, doesn't even have to be CSA or UL approved. So it's a fairly gentle coaxing support for one thing. The other thing that really validates the safety, first of all, it's been around in one form or another for almost three years now. Uh, the only reports we have are that people feel better, okay? Or they don't notice a difference. It's, you know, I think there are people who may think they have electromagnetic sensitivity and, you know, just by mitigating their environment, they feel better enough that they don't need something like the safe zone. That's fine. Mm -hmm. The other validating approach here, which is really something that is unique to what we're trying to do with our research, is seeing a normalization of brainwave function. Okay, that's something that doesn't happen if it's creating disruption. You don't see, you would not see that. It I totally surprised the scientists who were involved in, the, in this technology because they never saw brainwaves improving after... Uh, a second test. They always saw it getting worse. Okay. So that, uh, that I say basically is experiential and it's empirical evidence. Um, and then also from an electronic point of view, we know it's not producing anything that's uh, abnormal to physiology. It's producing something very close to the natural background frequency that we live in, in on the planet. So I think those are relatively good indicators of safety. Uh, but, you know, uh, I understand the, the concern. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the, my, my, my take on this whole thing is that we are, we are in a bizarre world, right? We have all these frequencies that are essentially untested for safety at this point, because the safety testing was completely bogus. I have plenty of uh, scientific evidence that I presented on my podcast for the last, what is it, se seven or eight years at this point. Uh, so we know that we are part of this big experiment where we are subjected to many artificial frequencies that have not been designed to heal, but have been designed to communicate. So who knows what it's doing to the body? The evidence we have is that there's various harms, uh, various symptoms that are associated with it. And when we choose to partake in healing modalities that use frequencies, at least it's it's much more likely that they're going to be healing because when they are developed it's with this intention in mind so that's why that's why personally i use pemf i use a red light right here in my office that can be here and just provide me with a different environment especially since i have you know canadian windows that block out a large spectrum of uh, the infrared that would get inside so i'm trying to mitigate my environment but i'm under no illusion that uh, i'm in this 
office in a perfectly natural environment. I think we are past that. And if you can live in complete nature immersion, well, by all means, you might not even need the safe zone. Or, you know, if you're regularly earthing, getting sun and unexposed to most of these artificial frequencies. However, for most of my audience and most people in the Western world, that's not the case. So we are stuck between rock and a hard place where we're trying to minimize the things that we think are disruptive and stressful. And we're trying to reintroduce the natural, sometimes it will be a man-made um, uh, frequency that will mimic natural. And that's that's how I, I perceive also supplementation. You know, that's not something natural, <laughs> putting things in capsules and eating it instead of, you know, eating veggies and meat and real food. But I do think there's a time and place for these things that are equally man-made, right? Yeah, they're human-made as well, but I'm not I, we shouldn't be dogmatic about these things. And in the end, since we're all part of this big experiment, it's up to you to continue experimenting with healing modalities. And that's really how I perceive the safe zone. Uh, it, I, I know we have a, a coupon code that people can use. It's going to be below. Uh, it's it's just EMF guy. If you want to try to save zone, it gives you 10% off. Uh, I know there's two versions, the standard and the plus. You mentioned the plus is... I guess is stronger, has a, a higher uh, intensity, I, I guess. Yeah, for Is intensity. it specifically for people with electrosensitivity mm -hmm. or is it if you live in a city like me, for example? A couple of reasons people might consider the plus version, which is, is, is a more powerful unit. It's, a, it's not that much more expensive than the standard one, but what it uh, does provide is the opportunity to uh, affect a larger area, let's say, up to, we think roughly we've measured it out to equivalent of above 4,000 square feet. However, it depends on the amount of electromagnetic pollution. So okay. we've had people in a, in a less than 2,000 square foot environment. I have a good example of someone in our, uh, if you look at the website, you'll watch some video testimonials. And she was, she's living in a town home where uh, a group of four townhomes, all those smart meters were placed on her unit. <laughs> so she lived in that environment and basically was a mess. She had all kinds of health problems, not sleeping. Her daughter wasn't sleeping. Her dog was a mess. And so I, I got her the safe zone. She has a colleague of mine. I said, try it out, Barb. You know, she's, she can, you can hear her discussion and instantly everything improved. Okay. But she lives in the same area as that woman with the epileptic son. And when they turned on the 5G, Things went to heck yeah. in a handbasket, we'll say. Uh, and then I said, you know, Barb, even though it was like 1,800 square foot and she was using the standard one, I said, Barb, try the plus version. And with the plus version, everything was solved. She went back to normal baseline. Her dog was sleeping through the night. And by the way, she didn't tell her daughter that the safe zone was in there to initially checking in with her, which I encourage people, if you're going to try the safe zone, you have family members who are having issues. And I did suggest this, I think to you, Nick, as well. Don't tell the other family members and certainly don't tell your pets that it's there, but you can tell the pets it's okay. Yeah. They don't even understand, but just to get a, a, a you know, get, rule out the placebo effect to see how it might influence uh, those people. And then, you know, you of course tell them, but the point is, is that this is something that you can test out for yourself. There's a 90 day free trial. So if you basically within 90 days, don't notice any benefit, there's a full refund available uh, as well. And I do want to mention one other uh, uh, item here, because there was a, a, a situation with this epileptic young man who was going back and forth with his father in another home where he totally did not uh, address this electromagnetic issue and he was uh, totally resistant to it. And so um, what happened was, let me just share my screen here. So what happened in this situation, he went back and forth to his father's home and the technology of that alternating polarity concentric magnet is actually an inherent part of the safe zone. It actually seems to boost the signal. And but at the same time, we know that it works on physiology. We've been able to measure that. It's verified by four double blind studies. But what was interesting is I got uh, the mother because he, when he came back from his father's house, he was a complete mess. 
he would be a completely a basket case for about two days every time he came back from his father's house. So what she did was she gave him uh, this matrix mag uh, device uh, and basically put it, sewed it into his clothing. Okay. And uh, we, we have a device that's available for home treatment, by the way. Uh, this is something also available on the website and that uh, same discount code can be applied to it. It's not an expensive device. And this can be applied to back problems, neck, knee problems, all kinds of things. It really does seem to stimulate healing. And in addition to that, we're developing products which can be um, wearable so people can actually get the benefit of having the, um, the not only the safe zone locally, and that can be plugged into a car, for example, as well, because it runs on a USB. So people have traveled with it in an RV or a car and uh, seems to really make a difference for some people who are sensitive. Um, in addition to that, you have the home treatment kit. Um, but then we're developing some wearables. So um, what happened is uh, the mother uh, gave uh, a couple of those matrix mag devices to the child uh, to her son at that time he was 17 sewed them into his clothing and also uh, into one of a cloth book that he would always, always carry around and when he came back from his father's home wearing those devices he would be disrupted for sure but he'd recover within an hour or two okay so this is something we've seen in a number of cases where not only the safe zone but these uh devices the actual elect alternating polarity concentric magnet so a wearable device can be helpful. So some people have applied this to their phone. I'm wearing one on my wrist here. It's a wristband that we're developing right now. These things are not readily available yet, but they're going to be in the near, near future. And so you, it's another area that you might want to consider something that you can do for yourself out in the world where it might be helpful for you as well, not just for helping with pain, which this the Matrix Mag kit does, it seems to support healing and reduction in inflammation and pain, but it might be beneficial to apply uh, if you're electromagnetically sensitive as well. Okay, so that's that's basically available um, on the site. And if I think if you use the same discount code, which is um, again, it's uh, it's EMF guy. I think is it right? Yes, is right? correct. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and. So, just an anecdote with these. I didn't tell you that. I, I have oh. one here in my office. Sometimes I use it. I've used it uh, on my knees. I've used it on my back. And sometimes it's just my right knee can tend to flare up if I increase my training volume. And I've been running a lot. And sometimes it's my hips. It's just something that doesn't feel right. So I've used them in, in various situations. But then I saw my, bar my barber here, uh, Marco. And Marco is a young guy. You know, he's probably... 39, you know, uh, three years older than me. And he had this bad case of elbow tendonitis, maybe tennis elbow. And of course, he's a barber. So he's always hunched over, always, you know, kind of holding to the clipper and, and, and scissors and whatnot. And he could not do his job. So he told me, Nick, I cannot cut your hair today. You know, this pain is too much. I have to take a few days off. And my doc told me to slow down. And I said, okay, let me bring back something to you. And I, I brought him uh, one of your braces you have in that kit with one of these. And the week after that, I saw him and we had another appointment. I said, how do you feel? He said, well, I don't know if it worked, but you know, I have zero pain. So I, you know, I don't know what he did else, but he did wear it for a few hours uh, in the evening while watching TV. It was just, you know, a passive way of getting treatment. And for him, it worked right away. It helped him recover, calm down the inflammation. And it was something that had been bothering him for a while. So, uh, we see you know, that I, all the time. Yeah, we see yeah, it all the time. That's powerful. And it's, it's uh, you know, the technology is, wow, we didn't know exactly why it was working. And even going back to the 1980s, when the early technology was being developed, they never explained how it worked. But then I had uh, Dr. Havis in my office one time, and we were testing all the magnetic fields. She happened to scan the magnetometer over the magnet. And she went, oh my goodness, what's going on here? And she noticed when it was, on, on her hand or on the body, it was producing a, a fluctuating field, which no static magnet does. There's no, mm. basically to create that, you need a pulse magnetic field. 
Yeah. Right? So this is literally, we've been able to measure it systematically with a magnetometer to show it's actually providing a form of microcurrent when it's applied to the body, which is really, I think, why it's helping. So there is, you know, the scientific evidence from a symptomatic point of view, but there's actually now some physics which supports the theory of why it works. And so it's it's something that is remarkable. We've seen so many people benefit from it. And it's something that I really recommend people try because, uh, you know, other than going to a matrix repatterning practitioner, but we do see many cases where there's degenerative changes in the neck or in the knee and the shoulder. And then in between treatments, wearing the magnets over that area really supports tissue healing. And it really seems to support that uh the the improvement so something that, that this it's very cost effective it's not expensive uh i think the whole kit is uh i think 297 canadian yeah and uh your your viewers could get a, the 10 percent discount using your code so it's something that uh you know we think is of tremendous benefit yes and of course uh i did talk about pmf in the past but pmf can it for me i haven't really seen a device that i trust under 50 1500 Canadian, so about, you know, I don't know, 1100, 1200 USD. So it's very cost prohibitive. Whereas your kit, I think it's much more reasonable for the average person. So there's that, you know, the costs of PMF devices. And if the battery doesn't work, you have to change it. It's kind of an expensive medical technologies to possess, but this is much more passive. And I don't it, think this is going to break, it, you know? It, it basically has a 40 year half life. So <laughs> exactly. it's a very powerful uh, rare earth magnet. Now, yeah. the thing with the safe zone, as well, because the safe zone is broadcasting that normalizing field, you know, the PEMF devices you have to be in direct contact with yeah. to yeah. derive some of that benefit. But what we see is people just generally improving and, and, and improving their health over time, you know, because I think that the, a good PEMF device is going to provide those correct frequencies as well. And they work better when they're in the Schumann range. So with the uh, uh, safe zone device doing that, uh, you don't have to lie on top of it. You don't have to carry it around with you. You're basically in the home or the environment. You're being exposed to that, which is really what, you know, is what the earth provides, what grounding will provide, all of those things that we should be supporting our body with is something that we unfortunately now have to compensate a little bit because of our environment. So we can do the best we can and it's still relatively uh, cost effective. I think the, if, uh, you know, people go to the website, the standard uh, safe zone is 997. Uh, the plus version is 1297, again, 10% uh, off. And then uh, there's a like a 90, 90 day trial. So if there is, uh, you don't see a benefit, you just uh, contact uh, our company uh, through the website, and then uh, we'll provide you with a return label and you can return it for a full refund. Okay. That's perfect. I, I thank you for this discussion. I think, uh, we're going to talk next on the 2025 summit. There'll be one of the speakers. So I'm really looking forward to getting this information out there and your expertise around bioelectricity. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. I want to thank you personally for having seen me exchanging these, ide these ideas. I really feel like we're uh, like-minded and uh, it's really an honor to have had the, this discussion today. Dr. Roth, thank you so much. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And my whole mandate is trying to help people overcome limiting conditions. And, you know, to me, one of the big advantages of you addressing this electromagnetic pollution and recognizing now combining that with our the idea that when we're injured, we're more vulnerable to that. And getting the combined solutions for correcting the biomechanics, the cellular disruption, and then providing a better environment for healing, you know, this is what we, we need to help people understand and provide them with solutions, okay? And thank you so much for the opportunity to share that with your audience. Likewise. Well, I hope we can uh, reconvene later uh, if you have new findings, new, new studies, and continue the discussion. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thanks so much. In case this wasn't already obvious, the information provided in this podcast is not intended to replace medical advice. We always recommend that you review this information with a functional medicine practitioner or environmental medicine doctor 
who is up to date with the latest information on the dangers of EMFs and the best practices around electro hypersensitivity, just to name these two things. And if you want to support my work, please consider sharing this episode with people you care about. You can also invest in my book, courses, or recommended products found at theemfguy.com. Thank you.